Thank you very much. So I understand that this is the last session before the lunch. I hope I can still grasp your attention for just a little bit longer. Um, now, the two mutational signatures that I would like to discuss with you today were first discovered actually in breast cancer in 2012, but it was really in 2013 when the field was astonished by their relevance, which was at the time when mutational signatures were for the first time extracted across uh, most cancer types available at the time, and these two signatures, signatures 2 and 13, were found to be highly prevalent. And today, we think that together, they reflect traces of one of the major mutational processes in human cancer as such. So why together? Well, obviously, these signatures are different because signatures 2 is characterized by C2T mutations, whereas signature 13 by C2G and C2A mutations. But they have two things in common. So first of all, both signatures are characterized by mutations at cytosine, so that being C2T, C2G, or a C2A mutation. And second of all, if you look at the sequence context, cytosines in both signatures 2 and 13 are preceded by a thymine base, so very specific tranucleotide sequence context. Now, when these were discovered, people went into the literature to try to see whether these kind of mutational patterns were reported in any kind of biological context before to try to figure out what is causing them in cancer. And the answer was yes, they were reported. And as a matter of fact, it is APOBEC cited in the amineases that can cause these exact mutational patterns when they're overexpressed in experimental systems in vitro. Now, APOBEC enzymes are a family of 10 highly homologous, so highly similar enzymes that in humans actually evolved only recently through the application of the ancestral gene on the chromosome 22. So they're positioned on chromosome 22, one next to other, and they're very similar, and all of them share this highly homologous, also cited in the amylase domain. Um, now, the interesting thing here was that we didn't actually know about these things from cancer. We knew about them from immunity. Because as it turns out, APOBEC deaminases, although they can uh, mutate DNA in vitro, they were mainly known to us from mutating RNA and from mutating RNA of retroviruses and retrotransposons because, in fact, they are part of the innate immune response. So the context where these were studied the most before was HIV. And in other words, upon infection, these are meant to act on the viral sequence to edit it and to stop the virus from replicating. So this really uh, left uh, the field in wondering, is it at all possible that something that actually evolved to protect us from viral infection then also contributes to the development of cancer and as such is, a, is, is a matter of fact, a double-edged sword? So this uh, triggered the uh, whole new field of studies trying to link APOBEX and mutations observed in cancer. And it is only sufficient, actually, if you go into PubMed and you put in APOBEX and you put in cancer, so two terms together, you will see the flood of studies of these two fields colliding that started around the time that I just described to you and continues up until today. So fast forward to today, to 2019, when the algorithms that we have to detect mutational signatures are a lot more refined. And what I'm showing you here is just a list of samples where signature 2 and signature 13 are found. And very easily you can say, well, it's a lot, and if you were to quantify it, it's actually almost 80% of all cancer types in which we find these signatures. And then it is not that these signatures contribute to a small proportion of individual cancer samples from a particular cancer type. As a matter of fact, they contribute to more than a third of individual cancer from some of the major types affected. So we heard about esophagus, lung, breast, head and neck, bladder, cervix, and many, many other. And then you can also look at the individual numbers of mutations that these signatures contribute to individual cancers. And here each cancer is a dot, it belongs to its specific uh, cancer type. And on the y-axis you have numbers of mutations attributed to either signature 2 or 13, so this is taken from actually COSMIC. And you can see whereas in some cases these signatures can contribute small burdens of mutations, most commonly actually they contribute high, high mutational load. So underlying mutational process is a hypermutational one. Um, now, if you were now to actually compare these two lists, even though they're ordered in a different way, they're actually the same cancer types. And as a matter of fact, they are same cancer samples because you will find signature 2 and signature 13 most commonly in all cancer samples here, albeit at a different proportion. 
And why is that? It comes down to thinking a little bit about the mechanistics of how these arise and what we think is happening. So the process starts by Apovex, one of them, uh, deaminating cytosines, which then goes into uracil. And then depending on how you repair or how you act on that uracil, you will either get a C2T mutation, so this is uh, upon replication, or a C2G mutation, and I don't know what happened to my slides. Regardless, there are two different mechanisms, and depending on the direction which you go into, you can get a C2T mutation or a C2A and a C2G mutation. Um, now, most of the signatures that we talked about today, including signatures 2 and 13, are genome-wide. And so here I'm showing you proportion of the chromosome X, uh, and you have mutations positioned alongside that uh, portion of chromosome X. They're colored based on the base substitution, and then the Y axis, what is plotted, is intermutational di distance, so mutational distance between consecutive mutations. And what you can see is that they are uh, uh, more or less equidistant. This is what we see for the majority of the signatures. However, every now and then, this is observed. And first observed in the breast cancer, actually, where you get these clusters of mutations that are referred to as mutational showers or cottages by the Greek word thunderstorm. And then you can take these individual dots, so there are mainly C2T mutations, but there are others that you can't see because of the high burden of C2Ts, and then you can plot these into the sequence context, and what you get out is actually, again, signatures 2 and 13-like patterns. So again, we think it is Apovex that is behind this kind of clustered mutational signatures, and indeed, if you do the experiment in yeast, if you overexpress it, you will see that, but obviously the process is different because it's not a genome-wide random acquisition of mutations throughout all of the human chromosomes, here, Apovex are potentially localized to one specific spot. Um, now, for the second part of my talk, I'd like to actually talk about um, links that were made in the field between Apovex and mutations in cancer within three main streams of research. And that is uh, exper experimental sort of evidence from genetics, from mutational features, and expression in cancer. So I will start by mutational features, because this is how the link was originally made based on the literature. And then you can actually go and confirm this in the lab. So you can take each one of these Apovex members, you can overexpress them in yeast, and you will hope to find these particular patterns of mutations that we see in cancer to tell you, well, it is this Apovex that is likely causing mutations. Now, based on these experiments, very early on, two of the members can be dismissed because actually when you overexpress them, they don't cause mutations. So these two are unlikely to be our mutators. For others, you can take, so this is just an experiment showing you that overexpression for Apobec 3G. So you can take all of the mutations just at cytosine basis, because our signatures are characterized by mutations at cytosine basis. And then you can look at the sequence context, five bases left, five prime and three prime, to the mutated base. And what we are hoping to see is that the base at minus one position is red, so it's a T, because it is, this is the pattern of our signature. So for Apobex 3G, obviously this is not the case. There's a lot of blue at the position minus one. These are Cs, so this too is likely not our candidate. Others, however, and here I'm showing you only some of them, turn out to be inducing mutations in exactly the sequence context that we need, and you can see the predominance of T mutations at the minus one position. Now, in, so, from, so, so to say from this sort of experiment, you could say all of these are potential mutators. Now, in 2013, three independent expression-based uh, studies came out where people basically took those cancers with a lot of signatures 2 and 13, and they tried to associate burdens of these signatures with expression of individual Apovex members. And what came out of these three studies mainly is that it was expression of the Apovex 3 that was best associated with the burden. So here it is, a potential mutator. However, one thing to remember from these kind of studies is that when we look at RNA and DNA for the, from whatever kind of sample or a cell, in DNA we measure our signatures, in RNA we measure expression of the genes. Our signatures were acquired potentially throughout lifetime from fertilized egg, whereas expression is uh, cell state captured at that time point. So potentially what you're doing is associating two different time points. Um, and then as it happens, actually, probably, and uh, what I would say, one of the most stringent evidence for the involvement of Apobex in human cancer comes from genetics, 
because there is a common germline polymorphism that is essentially deletion of majority of the Apobec 3B sequence. So I've told you that these things exist together, one next to other on chromosome 22, and this germline polymorphism, germline meaning it's inherited, so it's every, in every cell of those people who inherit it, will delete Apobec 3B. And those people who have this germline polymorphism have increased risk of breast cancer, and those breast cancers usually have increased burdens of signatures 2 and 13. And this tells you two really important things, one of which is now you have a genetic evidence for the involvement of Apobex in human cancer, so this is not an artificial moment, uh, model, this is human data. And second of all, is that you may not need, or you don't need in this case, Apobex 3B. And as a matter of fact, there is a mechanism through which you can explain this because there is a, a promoter or enhancer region of Apobex 3B that comes down to Apobex 3A and we think it drives overexpression of Apobex 3A. So this really caused kind of, cha uh, you know, there was a shift in the gears in the field from Apobex 3B to Apobex 3A. And as it happens, over the past years, actually our pattern-based studies also evolved. And what people have realized, that even though Apobec 3A and Apobec 3B, when you overexpress them in yeast, the patterns use, uh, look quite similar, if you look more closely, so essentially you repeat the experiment, and you look a little bit closer at the position minus 2, so next to that timing, they actually have a slightly different sequence preference. So Apobec 3A prefers purine bases, whereas Apobec 3B, uh, sorry, Apobec 3A prefers pyrimidine bases, whereas Apobec 3B prefers purine bases. And then because now you can differentiate between two signatures that is caused in yeast, you can also go into human cancers and ask, well, what do they reflect? And as shown here for bladder, breast, head and neck and lung, you can see that there is a preference for the, pu uh, for the pyrimidine base and thus again further evidence that it is Apobec 3A that is the main mutator in these cancers. Now here is some data that I uh, wasn't originally going to show, but there was a paper that actually came out in Science about a couple of weeks ago, where people have taken a further extended sequence context, so you can go further, so we, our signatures are trinucleotide bases, I've just shown you what happens if you take one more in this particular example, you can go further. And they have analyzed this kind of apobex specific mutations, so cytosines when preceded by a T, and what they have found is that actually in some of the Apobec, what we think are Apobec hotspots, they occur in the sequence context that's predicted to form these loops. And then you can again take your Apobec 3A, you can again take your Apobec 3B, you can express them in yeast, and you can ask, well, which one is causing mutations and loops? And as it turns out, again, it is Apobec 3A. So what I have just told you is the sort of ongoing debate that's going in the field, but there is now growing and growing evidence about the involvement of Apobec 3A from genetics, from mutational features. Expression-based studies point to Apobec 3, but I've discussed the potential limitation of those. That is not to dismiss Apobec 3A, but it is to say that from these other studies, Apobec 3A may be that major hypermutator. Some of them we dismissed, and some of them actually can cause mutations that are sequence context of uh, interest, but actually they don't have access to nucleus, so they don't have access to DNA, or they have a tissue-specific uh, expression that doesn't reflect cancers where we see these signatures. Now, one stream of research that is missing from the field is a direct exper experimental evidence. So everything that I've talked about so far are links and are associations. What we still don't know, whether it is really Apobex that are in a human cancer cell generating this signature. We have links, we don't have the direct evidence. Which Apobex is it? Good evidence for 3A, but is it? And then finally, and most importantly, what is actually activating these things? So what is making these things go every now and then crazy and mutate human DNA instead of viral RNA? Um, now, the reason that there is no direct experimental evidence is because the field has been missing models. And the appropriate model in this case would be a human cancer cell that endogenously, so without any kind of experimental perturbation, acquires this signature over time. So that's the condition number one. And then the condition number two is that it is genetically amenable. So you can delete Apobex and you can try to stop mutation acquisition. 
So in 2019, or actually earlier this year, we have annotated mutational signatures across 1,001 human cancer cell lines. So this is the largest uh, panel of cell lines, mo and it includes most cell lines used widely in cancer research, alongside smaller proportion of PDX models that we looked at as well. And we were actually able to tell which of these 1,001 cell lines has which panel of signatures. Now, once we know that, the second requirement for a good model is that these signatures continue to be acquired over time. So we have actually designed in vitro experiments where we were able to, in cancer cell lines with known mutational signatures that we selected from this large panel, track mutation acquisition over very specific time frames. And then once we were able to do that, we were able to count mutations acquired, we were able to tell which signature do they belong to, and we were actually able to track activities of underlying mutational processes. So we were able to tell, is the mutational process continuous, is it discontinued, or is it perhaps episodic? So discontinued, you can think about, for example, if a cell line has a lot of UV light signature, it was perhaps derived from a melanoma of a cancer patient who was exposed to a lot of UV light, but that signature will not be ongoing in culture because you're not exposing cells to UV light. So this was um, a large screen over uh, as many signatures as we could find and uh, dozens of cell lines and hundreds of clones, and I'm not going to go into uh, all of them. Uh, rather, I will just focus on two of our signatures that are Apobec associated. And here, just for the simplicity, I will show you two cell lines that obviously have these patterns and how we track them and track mutation acquisition over three different time points. And the first thing that we saw was actually that these signatures were not ongoing, that disappeared over time in culture, and that made perfect sense because in our cultures there is no immune system, Apobex are known to be part of the immune system, so there is nothing to activate them. However, as we included more and more samples, we actually started finding cell lines that do, in fact, acquire Apobex signatures over time. And this then told us two things. First was that actually Apobex mutagenesis can be initiated in the absence of the immune system, so it's likely endogenous here. And second of all, the thing that was noticed was that the mutation rates were highly different. So these two, for example, lineages from the same cell line were propagated for the same number of days, around 70, and they acquired very different numbers of mutations. And you can see that everywhere for these signatures, but it's something that we didn't see for other signatures examined. So when we went to look at that more closely, we have taken a cell line with signatures 2 and 13, and we have grown it over very short periods of time. And we have seen that these signatures disappear and then they come back on because before they disappear again. And this really tells you that the mutational process behind generating these signatures is episodic, so presumably whatever is activating Apobex comes in the intermittent bursts of the activity, and again I emphasize it's something that we haven't seen for any other signatures. Um, now, importantly, what comes out of this study is that now you do have a model where you can actually go on, knock out, or so remove, delete, individual Apobex and try to provide a direct experimental link for their role in cancer. And this is exactly what we are pursuing. So here I'm showing you a BT474. It's a human breast cancer cell line. This is a wild type cell line, so it obviously has the signature. After 60 days of in vitro propagation, it continues to acquire it, and you can see different numbers acquired, presumably because of the episodic nature. Then we can remove Apobex 3B, and as it happens, the signature keeps on going on. However, if we remove Apobex 3A, we can deplete the signature acquisition. And what this now tells you is, first of all, for the first time, you do have an experimental link, direct one for Apobex generating signatures in cancer. The models work, so the system works. And third of all, in this particular breast cancer cell line, Apobex 3B is dispensable. And this is actually a great collaboration with John, Machowski, the MSKCC, and we have generated many of the Apobex knockouts, many of the downstream enzymes involved in the mechanistics behind generating different types of the mutations and cytosines. Um, and, and we continue to do that. So I would like to thank to Mike, to Ludmil, to many, many great colleagues at Sanger um, and elsewhere. Thank you very much.